For a broader perspective on this story, we've reached Nader Hashemi, well-educated in Canada at the University of Western Ontario, Carleton University, and the University of Toronto. He's now director of the Centre for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver, but we reached him in London, England. Mr. Hashemi, you've argued that Iran is facing, I think, what you called a crisis of legitimacy. What do you mean by that? Well, we're approaching the 40th um, anniversary of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. And over the past roughly four decades, a lot has changed internally in Iran. Um, um, first and foremost, the, I think the revolution has broadly failed to meet the expectations of, it, of its own uh, uh, population, particularly uh, young people who form the um, vast majority of um, Iranian society and who are you know, highly educated, globalized, and aspire for, um, you know, greater rights and freedoms than the regime can actually deliver. So this is a regime that relies on repression and manufacturing foreign threats to sustain itself, and we're seeing it right now in the context of the uh, election campaign that is taking place in Iran that's, you know, not a free and fair election, but there is some space for people to express themselves. and. Um, anyone who's following those elections can clearly see this desire for political change and the regime trying to carefully manage these demands. So I think that's fundamentally what I mean by this crisis of legitimacy that the Islamic Republic is facing today. So what are you watching for in this election campaign then? What, do you, what can we learn about sort of where things are in the society by watching the campaign itself? Well, what's really revealing is to... Um, uh, watch the um, uh, the actual campaign rhetoric and the arguments being advanced by the incumbent president Hassan Rouhani who is trying to really inspire his base um, and he's had to uh, um, appeal to their demands for political change and just just yesterday there was a major sort of um, development when the supreme leader you know fearing that the um, rhetoric of the campaign was getting out of control because people at these campaign rallies um, uh, both the candidates and the um, constituents are you know talking about um, you know human rights they're talking about democracy they're talking about freedom for um, political prisoners they're talking about gender relations and the supreme leader is you know extremely worried about this just yesterday he had to um, you know, invoke the threat of George Soros, who might take over and manipulate the current electoral campaign to subvert Iran's independence. So watching this sort of back and forth between the candidates and their attempt to really appeal to sentiments that are deeply rooted in the hearts and minds of most middle class and young Iranians who aspire for political change. If you want to inspire them to come out to the polls to overcome their sense of apathy, um, you have to appeal to their sentiments. So I'm, that, that, is, that is very revealing to me and it sort of confirms um, this you know, theme of, 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 of a deep crisis of legitimacy that the Islamic Republic is facing today. Um, and um, I think it's fascinating to watch simply from the perspective of uh, those of us who study authoritarian regimes and democratic uh, transitions. When you talk about legitimacy, of course, you know, for countries outside of, uh, outside of Iran, they're looking at Iran's influence in the region, and obviously of particular concern is, is the role in Syria. Put that in some perspective for us now. If that legitimacy uh, in any way affects their power and influence in the region, well, you know, there is a connection. I mean, it's not a coincidence that Iran um, is heavily backing the uh, authoritarian regime of Bashar al-Assad, and it did so in many ways in the context of the Arab Spring protests. Iran was very fearful of the Arab Spring protests um, coming into Iran from the Arab world, and uh, that's one of the reasons why it's backing the uh, Assad regime. I mean, there's other reasons as well. Iran's, ha Iran's regime has a, a sort of national security doctrine, and it views um, Bashar al-Assad as central to that doctrine, primarily because it's um, Iran's key ally in the region, and it allows Iran to have access to Hezbollah. And it fears that if um, Assad is toppled, then its adversaries, primarily Saudi Arabia and its allies, will will uh, advance their interests. So Iran, you know, is um, uh, um, supporting um, its, uh, its ally in Damascus largely because I think it fears that if there is a popular movement for, you know, um, political change and democratic transition, that that could, you know, have a um, reverberating effect in its own territory. And, it, and, and there's actually a lot of documentation and, um, uh, you know, evidence to suggest that's one of the reasons why Iran um, got involved in the Syria campaign 
um, in, in, in 2011. Um, so I think that's, that's the connection that I see between this crisis of legitimacy within Iran and its support for um, the Assad regime in Damascus. I, I also want to ask you, uh, obviously, about the relations between uh, Iran and other countries, and particularly Canada. We know that there were diplomatic officials uh, in Tehran this week uh, having some kinds of conversation about trying to open up uh, conversations between the two governments. How, how significant is that? Well, I think it's, it, it is significant because, you know, relations were severed in 2012 um, under the previous government of Stephen Harper, and there was, you know, a lot of talk and, you know, discussion um, both um, in the last Canadian election campaign as to when those relations would be restored. Um, and so now we're seeing, I think, the first uh, solid evidence that there has been a lot of uh, back-channel communication and steady and slow steps toward uh, establishing uh, relations. It's a difficult, you know, position for the uh, Liberal government to be in because there's a lot of um, uh, uh, interest groups that have um, a stake in this debate, uh, both in favor of establishing, you know, relations and, and those who strongly feel that it's, uh, it's the wrong move for Canada. But it's pretty clear that, you know, a decision has been made to move forward and these steps are taking place uh, slowly but surely. And I suspect unless there's some sort of major development, um, that's the direction where we're headed in. Since that nuclear deal was signed in 2015, there was an indication that Iran was going to open itself up for business and that other countries, apart from Canada, have stepped forward in, in some significant way to invest in Iran. Uh, some business people have suggested Canada has, in, in effect, missed an opportunity by not having uh, established, uh, you know, diplomatic relations. What's, what's your view? Has Canada missed an opportunity? Well, I think it has. You know, it's, it's widely viewed that Iran is an untapped market because of the international sanctions that existed. Um, Europeans have stepped in, and Canada really has been at a, a disadvantage from that perspective because it didn't have diplomatic relations, and there was no opportunity for Canadian businesses to take advantage of this new opening. So I think that, in many ways, is a big driver um, um, internally within Canada that is um, a huge factor in, in, in um, the Trudeau government seeking to sort of move forward in that direction so that, um, you know, Canadian businesses can take advantage of this, uh, of, this of this opportunity in Iran. Thank you very much for your expertise on this. Happy to help. Thanks.